Good morning. You may be seated. And we are going to read 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 through 5. And I'm reading from the New English, or from the English Standard Version. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want to speak, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, worship team. Good morning. I hope you have this feeling that I have, that Sunday is the best day of the week. And uh, when you get to sing and worship and sing songs like we did this morning, uh, I don't know how your week was. Um, We come in with different baggage from the week, different experiences and things. But to be able to kind of together recenter on Christ and then be refueled to go out again, uh, I hope you're encouraged by it. Well, back in December of 2021, uh, we as a church were in the process of changing our website and making some changes overall to improve it and stuff. And so I was part of an email conversation along with uh, Zach Davidson, the DCS principal, our superintendent now, principal then, uh, Greg Karch, our DCC webmaster, and a web developer named Michael, uh, who was helping us get all that transition taken care of and all that. And he was uh, sending us a note of what he still needed from us to make sure that that site could go live and all that kind of stuff. And I want to share with you a brief portion of that email conversation because I think it illustrates the main point that Paul's trying to make this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 25. This was the email from Michael, the web developer, from Tuesday, December 14th, 2021. Quote, As mentioned, to go live on CMS v2, we will need to update the DNS records for the website, change the A host for uh, record for at to point to 265.304.610.220, add or modify a CNAME record for for www that points to vmsa2.content.webhost.net, verify that there are no other records pointing to at since those would not resolve correctly anymore, obviously. If there's any forwarding currently set up, that needs to be removed as well. Once the records are updated, we will apply the SSL certs to the domains. Amen. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, I'm not a super smart guy, but I'm not dumb. I had no idea what Michael was talking about. I mean, because he was speaking in a language I'd never learned. And so, so the next Monday, I contacted Greg Karch. I wrote to him. Uh, I knew that he had a gift of interpreting. And he said, and I wrote, Greg, do you know what Michael's asking us to do? Well, five minutes later, this was Greg's response. Yes, praise the Lord. Michael's asking us for the DNS records to be updated to a new IP address that hosts the V2 content. But then Greg went on to help us understand what that meant, what Michael was requesting from us. And so now I knew the questions he was asking. I knew what information I needed to give to him. And so I could confidently, 17 minutes later, respond to him, thanks, Greg, I don't know the answer. (laughs) See, folks, Michael had the ability to speak in another language But it did nothing to help me know what I was supposed to do until Greg came in with the gift of interpretation that helped me understand what on earth he was saying. Now, question. Anybody else ever had an experience like that? Well, where someone started speaking in some kind of language and you were just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. 
Or, or maybe you had even a worse, a different kind of conversation, and it was worse because you sensed that the person was speaking that way in a certain way that you couldn't understand, and they could, in order to make you feel silly because they wanted to exalt themselves. Well, that sort of thing seems to be what was happening at the church of Corinth with the gift of tongues. Many in the church were building themselves up by speaking in tongues, but nobody could understand what it was that they were saying because they didn't have anybody to interpret. And so here in chapter 14, Paul addresses that problem by pointing them to pursue love through desiring gifts that strengthen up the entire body, everyone in the church, and not just themselves. And specifically, to desire the gift of prophecy, because that gift is one that communicates in words that people can understand. And therefore, it has the potential to both strengthen the brothers and sisters in Christ and to turn unbelievers into worshipers. And the lesson that I hope we leave with this morning is the same lesson that we've been observing that permeates every one of these chapters on spiritual gifts. And it's this. No matter how gifted we are and no matter what gift it is, those gifts are best used in service to the church in a way that will best serve the church. And if those gifts involve words coming out of our mouths then we should be careful to watch our language so that what comes out truly does strengthen and encourage and instructs people toward loving each other and worshiping God. And so that's where we're going. And so to prepare for our discussion, let's pray and ask the Spirit to teach us and make clear what could very well not be clear this morning if we're not careful. So, so Father, we come to you. Have you opened up your word, getting ready to study uh, the word that you've given to us? that we have access to because you are gracious and you have spoken to us through the prophets. You've spoken to us through your son. You've spoken to us through those who, who wrote these words down that you want us to learn. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us this morning. That we'd be able to understand what it is you want us to learn and what, is, what you want us to do in an application. And, uh, and we pray that all of it would be toward the building up of one another and toward the, the greater worship of Jesus. And so, Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, keep your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 14. And uh, last week I made the point that chapter 14 uh, continues Paul's discussion of spiritual gifts that he began in chapter 12. And that chapter 13 was this break in the discussion uh, to make sure that the Corinthians were pursuing the spiritual gifts, but doing so in love. That they weren't doing it just for the gifts, but they were doing it in service and love for one another. And the reason he needed to give them that warning, give them that caution, give them that help, is because of how he had ended chapter 12. He had closed out that chapter in verse 29 with these words. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? The understanding would be no, they don't all, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. And so Paul left off this discussion with the acknowledgement that not everyone will have every gift. And so that's, that's going to be really important for us this morning when we talk especially about tongues and prophecy. Not everyone's going to have the same gifts, but that everyone should desire the higher gifts. And by desire, meaning God gift us with the gifts that would be best for serving the church. The word there for higher is the word megas. Uh, it means big or large or important. That's why in English we, have, we use the word mega for various things, things that are big. We have megatron, we have megalodon, we have megamind, right? These are big things, and so we use this word mega in front of it. Well, that's the word that Paul uses in chapter 12 to instruct the Corinthians to earnestly desire the higher or the greater or the mega gifts. Not maga, by the way, mega and so when he picks up the topic, again, he uses that word to identify prophecy as one of the greater or mega gifts. Look at verse 1. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. 
The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater, megas, than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. So here you have Paul saying to desire the spiritual gifts and especially prophecy. And then verse 5, he says that the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. And so for Paul, the greater gift is the gift of prophecy. And the one who prophesies is greater or higher than the one who speaks in tongues unless those tongues are, are interpreted. Because unless they are interpreted, they won't have the same equal effect. All right? And by greater, he doesn't mean that the person is more loved in the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that they step up into a higher class of Christians. It doesn't mean that they're, you know, we have a social status and things in the church and this makes them greater. He's simply saying that the gift of prophecy is a greater gift than the gift of tongues if those tongues do not have an interpretation. And the reason that this is all important for Paul to say is that this church appears to have elevated speaking in tongues without an interpretation to be the highest and most sought-after gift. It's like they're using it and they're saying, look what I can do that you can't do, that sort of thing. Well, why then is prophecy a greater gift? What criteria is Paul using to decide which gifts are greater? Well, Paul makes that very clear several times in the passage. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, in contrast to someone who speaks in tongues, he says the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding. Verse 4, while the tongue speaker builds up himself, the one who prophesies builds up the church. In verse 5, the one who prophesies is greater than the one who has the untranslated tongues so that the church may be built up. Now, do you see a common theme there? We have this idea of building up. The principle that Paul is making to judge which of the gifts is greater is the ability of that gift to build up the whole church. Which leads us to point number one this morning. The greater gifts, the mega gifts, if you want to put it that way, the greater gifts are those that build up the whole church. They build up the whole church. That is the gifts that we should earnestly desire and we should pray that God would give us as individuals and that he would provide for the church. Those gifts are the ones that build up and strengthen and encourage and comfort the entire church and don't just build up ourselves. And in this passage, Paul is contrasting the gift of prophecy with the untranslated tongues that happen. And those tongues happen in two different contexts. The first context is within the personal, private prayer life of an individual believer. Verse 2, he talks about a person speaking in tongues, not to men, but to God. And so he's praying. And he describes in verse 14, a gift of tongues that is given to a person in their personal times of prayer to God. And it seems like this is what Paul's talking about. And when he says in verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. I think what he's talking about is his personal prayer life. He speaks in tongues to God. The reason I think he's talking about his personal prayer life is because if he spoke in tongues more than all of them, they would know if it was public, and there would be no interpreter, right? And so I think he's talking about his personal prayer time. And so the first context of the gift of tongues is personal prayer that can encourage and build up the individual believer as they pray to God in a gift of tongues, and that might be edifying to them. Perhaps that's that groanings that, that's talked about in Romans where, where they go to God with words that you can't understand. Like Maybe that's what Paul's talking about, something along those lines. So it might be valued to the individual, but it doesn't do anything to build up the church. The second context is when the gift of tongues is used publicly. And that's where a person takes that personal gift of tongue speaking and they speak it out loud, loud enough for everyone to hear, and and they speak out some kind of word or message from from God that even they don't know exactly what it is that it means. It's, It's a tongue they haven't learned, they don't understand. But it's heard by those in the church. Paul says that that gift can build up the body if those tongues are translated, which we'll talk about in just a minute if they're interpreted so people can understand them. But that's why he says the gift of prophecy is greater than that. 
And the reason prophecy is greater, it has to do with the very nature of what the New Testament gift of prophecy is. Now, there's a lot of different opinions on this. I'm just going to admit that to you. A lot of different thoughts on what this gift is. And so I'm going to give you uh, what I think is probably the the best definition. Uh, If you want to do your own study, I'll refer one book to you that's been really helpful for me. It's uh, Bible Doctrine by Wayne Grudem. And uh, it's just a theological book that goes through different topics, but this is one of those. And Grudem studied all the different ways that the word prophecy is used in the New Testament. And he came through all of that study to define prophecy in the New Testament this way. The New Testament gift of prophecy is telling something that God has spontaneously brought to mind. So if he's right, prophecy in the New Testament with people who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, this is not the same as the gift of teaching or preaching, though there may be prophetic words that are within teaching and preaching, but it's not the same. And it functions differently than prophecy does in the Old Testament. If you think about it, in the Old Testament, we had prophets of God. You know, we had Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and Micah. And the Holy Spirit would come upon those prophets and they would speak God's very words. That was the Old Testament prophet. Words about what God's people needed to do in the present. Maybe they needed to repent and that was God's word for them directly. Words about what God had planned for them in the future. And so this is going to happen and therefore these are are certain you can trust in these things. And those words were understood to be the very direct, inerrant, and infallible word of God and the authority for all of life. And that's why those prophets' words, we now have Bible uh, books that are named after them. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, we have these because these were the prophetic words directly from God, the very words of God. Now that's different than how we see prophecy described and used in the life of the New Testament church. While the New Testament gift of prophecy does seem to be both speaking forth something from God about the present and sometimes foretelling something about the future plan of God, the gift of prophecy in the New Testament is not treated as a direct, inerrant, and infallible word of God. According to 1 Corinthians 14.3, it appears to be a gift where someone receives some kind of message for upbuilding or encouragement or consolation from God. And that person shares that in the church. Maybe they share it from up here. Maybe they share it in a small group. Maybe they share it in a Bible study. Next week, we're going to learn from verses 26 through uh, 40 of this chapter that this gift is open to both men and women. And importantly, this gift of prophecy, the prophetic word that comes out, it's to be weighed and evaluated and tested by the congregation to see if it's actually from God. And so there's not this sense in which because someone says, thus saith the Lord, they say, this is from God. Everybody goes, okay, we'll do that. No, it's judged. It's sort of like when you get an email or a text message or a phone call and someone says this is coming from somebody else and you have to discern and test to see if it's really spam. That's what you have to do with this gift of prophecy in the New Testament. So we're not talking about something on the level of the authority of Scripture. We're talking about men and women in the church who believe the Lord is giving them something to say and they say to their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, look, I think the Lord would want us to know this. Or I sense that the Lord is speaking to us about this. And they say it, and then that message is evaluated by the measure of Scripture. It's measured in light of the authority of the Bible. Now, maybe that's new for you, that thought. Maybe that's something that's how you've always believed it. Maybe you've been in experiences where this has happened. Maybe you've been in a group reading the Bible, Bible study or something like that, and someone says something profound, and everybody kind of looks at each other like, wow, like that has to be from the Lord. And you compare it to Scripture, and it's exactly what the Scriptures teach, and it's an exact application to what you need for that situation. I think that's an example of what we're talking about here in the New Testament gift of prophecy. Now, if you want to fact-check what I'm saying, which I think you should do, okay, 
I've given you in the sermon notes, if you all have those, look to the questions at the bottom of the sermon notes. Question one has several verses that you can look up to see how this New Testament gift of prophecy is in use. In fact, there's one of those uh, examples where there is someone who speaks a prophetic word to Paul and he basically ignores them. So, so the gift of prophecy is not as clear-cut and clean as the Old Testament gift of prophecy. Look up those verses and see where you land. How do you see the Bible speaking of the New Testament gift of prophecy? But regardless of where you land in your understanding of what this gift is, the main thing for you to know right now as we're going through 1 Corinthians 14 is that Paul says that that gift of prophecy is greater than the gift of untranslated tongues because the gift of prophecy builds up the church. Now, before we get into why that's the case, why this gift is greater, let me just offer you a quick thought for application. I want you to notice how important it is to Jesus speaking through Paul that your desire for spiritual gifts is motivated by a pursuit of love for one another and is driven by a desire to build up your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why he wants you to desire those. That's why Jesus wants you to have these gifts. The picture that Paul is painting here is not the individualist image of church life today where where people shop around from different churches to see which one will serve them best. And then they sit in a pew or a chair for years being served by others in the church. And then they leave that church when it no longer meets their needs. That's expected in a restaurant or a grocery store or with your financial planner or your doctor. You can shop it and then leave when it no longer serves you and you don't have to do anything to serve them. But that's not the picture of life in the church. The the picture of church that Paul is painting here is a home where people belong, where they think first about the needs of their fellow family members. They think first about the needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ, and they desire to have those greater gifts, those mega gifts, that allow them to serve one another, even to the point of self-sacrifice. And that's why the gift of prophecy is a greater gift. It's because it does that for the church. It builds up the whole church, and not only the individual church member who has it. Now, how does prophecy do that? Why is it considered greater than uninterpreted tongues? Why is it able to build up the church more? Well, that's because of the principle of point number two this morning. For these gifts to build up, they must be understood. Right? If they're, if they're going to build up anybody, you've got to know what you're talking about. Right? They have to be understood. Look at verse 6. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues... How will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what's played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. So so here Paul starts by using illustrations from musical instruments to make his point. And and he says that people who speak in tongues without an interpretation, that would be like if, if I, which I have no musical bone in my body, I can't play any instruments, it'd be like if I picked up a harp or a flute or a bugle and I just started plucking on it or just started blowing into it, right? You're not gonna know what I'm playing. I wouldn't know what I was playing, right? Think about if you've been in school here, you know, or you remember elementary school, and that first week of lessons on the recorder for the elementary kids, right? They don't know what they're playing. You wouldn't know what that sounds. They're just sounds. They are not songs, right? No, it's no good for anybody because they don't understand. Now, give them the second week, and maybe. Mary had a little lamb. It's coming. It's on the way. But until then, it's just noise, nothing recognizable, That's what Paul's describing here with people that have untranslated tongues. And Paul continues in verse 10. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I'll be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. That makes sense, right? 
go into a foreign country, you don't understand the language, they don't understand what you're saying, you don't understand what they're, what they're saying, so you end up doing you know, hand motions to try to figure stuff out, right? So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. It's unfruitful because even he doesn't know what words he's saying. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Now, here comes a key point, verse 16. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider, that's a person who doesn't understand the language you're speaking, how can they say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person's not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind, or five words that I can understand, in order to instruct others, than 10,000 words, the highest number in Greek, 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, there is a lot in those verses. There is a lot of things that we can delve into this morning if we have the time, but I don't want us to lose uh, Paul's main point and get stuck in the proverbial weeds. Paul's main point in all of this is encapsulated in verse 16. If a person is speaking in a tongue and it is not translated so that people can understand, it might be a great word of prayer. It might be a great word of thanksgiving to God, but no one's going to be able to say amen to it. No one's going to be able to say, I agree to what you just said, because nobody knows what you just said. Now, by way of application, here's what I think that means for us. We're going to start thinking about it. Well, how does that apply to us? First, I think it means that when you see a, a teacher or a preacher Someone on TV, this happens a lot with televangelists. And in the midst of a sermon or a lesson, they break out in speaking in tongues. And all of a sudden, they're like, who stole the keys to my Honda, right? They say something. And, and, and you don't understand it. And there's no interpretation. Unless there is an interpretation to follow, that is a completely inappropriate use of the gift of tongues in the church. It doesn't build up anybody. And so, so don't be enamored by it. Pray for that person. Pray for that church. They have people speaking in ways that they don't understand. And don't buy into the lie that they may teach that if you don't speak in tongues, that you are not completely filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, Paul desired in chapter 14, verse 5, that all people could speak in tongues. He makes very clear in chapter 12, verse 30, that not all people are given that gift. And, and so requiring tongues as a sign of having the Holy Spirit, if you come across a church or a person who's teaching that, just know that is flat-out false teaching. It's not true. It's not biblical. So that's the first application. Second application. It means that if you desire the gift of tongues, first ask God to give you the gift of prophecy so that you can build up your brothers and sisters in the church with words that you can understand and that they can understand. First, seek that gift. If you want to ask the Lord for a gift, you can certainly ask him for the gift of tongues, but, but ask him for the gift to prophesy, to speak his words to encourage the body. And then if you do request to be able to speak in tongues, then also ask him for the gift of interpretation. Ask him for both. Or ask that someone else will come into the church so that they can interpret what is said. And if there's no interpreter and God gives you that gift of speaking in tongues, then don't speak out loud. Keep it to yourself. Because unless it is out and, and, and for the body where they can understand it, it's just speaking into the air. Don't confuse the body with that. Nobody else is going to be able to say amen to what you said. No one else is going to be encouraged or comforted or built up there's not also an interpretation. Because for these gifts to build up, they must be understood. Now, if they are understood, then good things begin to happen, which leads us to point number three this morning. When understood, these gifts are a call to worship God. 
When they're understood, when people know what's being said, then these gifts are a call, and they're a call to worship God. Look at verse 20. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. While prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you were out of your minds? So Paul starts off here in verse 20 by labeling their misuse of tongues as childish and immature. And it makes me think of uh, at sports and art camp, I used to carry around a megaphone and, I'd, you know, talking to parents, getting the kids excited as they came in and things like that. And every once in a while, I would let the kids speak in it so they could say, you know, hi, mom, or hi, everybody, or something like that. I'm glad to be here, things like that. But there was always that one kid who all he wanted to do in the megaphone is scream, right? So here's the megaphone is, ah, right? And it's just annoying. Everyone within 10 feet, like they can't hear because it was so loud, Well, Paul says to the Corinthians that in their use of tongues without an interpreter, they are that kid. They're immature. And Paul is essentially saying, grow up, folks. And then in verse 21, he says why that's important for both believers and unbelievers. And he goes to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament to make his point. In Isaiah 28, Isaiah was prophesying to the people of Israel that because of their unwillingness to hear and respond to God's invitation for salvation, God was going to send the Assyrians to bring judgment on the people of Israel. And so he's going to be sending foreigners to bring judgment, and those foreigners would be speaking languages that Israel did not understand. And when they came, that would be a sign to them that God was in fact bringing judgment on them. Well, Paul quotes that here in verse 21 to make the point in verse 22 that if a person publicly speaks in tongues in the gathering of the church, and I think he's talking about tongues without an interpretation, and an unbeliever comes into the room, like in the situation with the people of Israel, it is going to be a sign of God's judgment on them. Why? Why would it be a sign of judgment? Because if they enter into this auditorium or into a Bible study or a small group and people are speaking in tongues that nobody understands, you can imagine what that unbeliever is going to think. What are these people part of a cult? Like, are they high on drugs? What is up with these folks? And instead of hearing the message of the gospel that invites them to turn from their sin and follow Christ, in verse 23, Paul says, that person is going to think that everyone in the church is out of their minds. And that's going to be an obstacle to them listening to the gospel, and they're going to leave without turning to Christ. And therefore, untranslated tongues are a sign of judgment on them because their inability to understand what is being said will keep them from turning from their sin and keep them from turning in worship to Christ. Which is why Paul says these are a sign not for believers who are not under judgment, but for unbelievers who are. It's also why Paul directs the church to desire more the gift of prophecy. Because in verse 22, prophecy is a sign for believers. Probably meaning a sign that God is there and he's working among them and he still has messages for us that come through the gift of prophecy that align with the scriptures. And then he says in verse 24, in contrast to tongues, which which cause people to think that we're crazy, verse 24, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever outsider enters, he's convicted by all. He's called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. And so this is an unbeliever coming into a meeting of the church and hearing a prophetic message in language and in words that they can understand. And because they can understand it, that message begins to work on their hearts. Now, we're not told what kind of message that is. We're not given the content and what Paul's talking about, but he does give us the result. This unbeliever is convicted and called to account by all the words that are said, and the secrets of his heart are disclosed. 
In other words, his sin is exposed. He gets to see who he really is between him and God. And so perhaps this prophetic word that someone speaks, perhaps it's a, it's a call to repent from a particular sin. Somebody in the room says, I, I think we need to repent of this kind of sin. And that person has come in, that unbeliever has come in, and they're practicing that sin. And they say, oh my goodness, this is from God. This is from me. This is speaking to me. But regardless of what the, the specific prophetic message is, the result is conviction of sin And verse 25, humble worship and a recognition that God is alive and present in the church. And and so instead of them thinking that the people in the church are crazy, they're left with this thought that God lives among them and they realize that among God's people, they are on holy ground. And so they fall on their face in worship to God. Now, what kind of prophetic word has the power to bring about that kind of conviction and that kind of heart transformation. What what could possibly be said that would have that result? Folks, the only prophetic word that's going to do that, the only word that you say this is a prophetic word for you, the only thing that we can say that's going to point people to that end result is that which points people to the word of God. It's got to point people to the Bible. For it is the word of God that Hebrews 4.12 says is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God exposes us to our sin. The word of God speaks to our hearts. No mere human words can do that. No prophetic message can do that on its own. But a prophetic word that leads people to the words of Scripture, which can bring conviction and disclose the, the, the thoughts of the heart, that message can, because the Holy Spirit does that through the Bible, through the Word of God. And the power of the Word of God to change a life and to bring about belief in an unbeliever and repentance in a resist, resistant sinner and worship in an idolatrous rubble, that power is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. Thank you. And therefore, for any prophetic word, for any prophetic message to be encouraging or comforting or to build up both for believers and unbelievers, that prophetic word must point people to the written word of God, and it must point people to the good news about Jesus because Jesus is the word of God in the flesh. It's got to point people to the gospel message. And it's got to do that in words that they can understand because the gospel tells us In plain English, because we have the translation now, it tells us that we're sinners. We're rebels against God. We sin against him all the time. We do. And we know that because when we sin, we try to hide, right? It's obvious. And in our sin, we, we are guilty of an offense against God that comes with a cost we can't pay because we have sinned against a holy and perfect God. That's understandable, isn't it? That's clear. But it tells us then that Jesus, the very word of God, fulfilled the promises that God made through the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus came with a message from God of forgiveness and hope for us as sinners through putting our faith in Jesus Christ. That gospel message, which is clear, gives us, it exposes sin in us as sinners. And it has the ability to bring us on our faces in worship to Christ. And so whatever prophetic word may come out of any one of our mouths, we need to watch our language. That word must point us to the word of God, and it must point us to the word of God in flesh, to Jesus and to his gospel. All right, so how do, we, how do we apply this as we close? With all of that said, well, first of all, let me address the unbeliever who might be here right now. And let me just say, if you're here, we're glad you're here. It's good that you're here. Because you need to hear this message, and it's not my word. This is God's word to you. Hear this. 
God says you are a sinner. If that's news to you, I just want you to hear it. It's from the word of God. You are a sinner. And you are condemned in your sin with a life without hope and without God. And if you were to die today without putting your faith in Jesus, you will go to hell for eternity in conscious torment. I didn't say that. God's word says that. And there is nothing that you can do on your own to fix that. Nothing. But the good news is that Jesus did everything needed so that that can be fixed. The good news is that because God loves you, he sent Jesus to die in your place. And in his death and resurrection, he did everything needed to fix the problem of your sin, to offer you forgiveness of sin, and to give you a hope for a future of a life with him. And so the Bible says, the word of God says, repent. Turn away from sin and turn your faith and your worship away from anything else and turn to Jesus. Not my words, the word of God. Now, if you're already a believer, then this is the message for you. Again, this is from the word of God. The same Jesus who died on the cross for your sins was raised to life so that he could send the Holy Spirit. He could send the Holy Spirit into your life to do a couple things. One of them is to empower you with gifts, to give you gifts so that you can serve one another and to unite you as people who have the same spirit. You have the Holy Spirit if you are a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, and therefore you have the power to be able to do what he's called you to do as a body. And he's done that so that you can build up each other as a church. He's given you gifts. And so use them. Use those gifts, not simply to edify and build up yourselves, but use them to serve one another and use them properly because they came at great cost, the cost of the very life of Jesus on the cross, which is actually what we get to remember this morning as we turn our hearts to communion. In this celebration, we get to remember what Jesus did to, to secure our salvation, to make possible everything that we've talked about this morning, to be empowered to encourage each other. And so, so that communion doesn't sound like a foreign language to you, let me just explain in easy words. The bread reminds us of his body that was given, beaten, and killed in our place. And as we take it, we get to remember he gave that for us. He gave it for us individually, and he gave it for us as a church to recognize it and remember it as a church. And the juice reminds us that his blood was shed on the cross. And that was not only sufficient to pay for our sin, but his blood preaches a message of Jesus' promise to us that he will never leave us or forsake us. And someday he will return to take us to be with him. And so, so that's the plain message. And if you believe that plain message, feel free to take communion with us this morning. If you're not quite there yet, that's Okay. Uh, we'll pray that the Lord would open your eyes and heart to that, but when the elements of, of communion just come, just pass them by. That's totally okay. Now, before we take communion this morning, I want to give you a few minutes to prepare your hearts, uh, to confess of any sin that maybe the Lord is revealing to you, uh, to examine your heart, to see if you have the right attitude about Jesus or his church. Maybe you've been harboring some thoughts that you shouldn't about either one of those things. And so I want to give you some time to, to just make things right with the Lord, and then we'll take communion together. So let me pray, and then, and then this time will be yours. Father, we're so grateful for the sacrifice that uh, you offered in your son to give us Jesus, so that Jesus, you would go to the cross to pay for all these things we've talked about. Hope, life, gifts, forgiveness. As we take this time to remember Jesus, that sacrifice. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, speak to us, that you would communicate to us, uh, revealing sin, exposing the sin in our own lives, helping us to confess of those things, and then to be resolved in the power of your spirit, to use the gifts that you've given us to, to encourage and edify the body, and not just ourselves, and to apply whatever elements of this message that maybe I haven't even thought of, that you would be revealing to your people
Lord, would you use this time to help us through that process in Jesus' name? All right, this time is yours.